very uh, prevalent for therapists, especially the beginning therapists mm. who want to rush in and help and uh, you know utilize their tree, try hard driver to a large extent and and put a lot of energy into yeah. connecting. And as as I'm saying, often the uh, client can feel overwhelmed and yeah. withdraw even more. Yeah, totally. Which okay. again, it does come with experience, you know, and, and I know we've spoke about it in other podcasts, you know, silence can be quite profound in a therapy room and having space. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Okie dokie, welcome back to episode 82 um, of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. Gosh, so 82. Yeah, the last one of this year. It's the last one of the year. The last one of the year. And what we're going to be talking about is attachment. Which I think is is quite apt. I'm attached to to seeing you every Thursday, Bob, when we do these podcasts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So to attach, um, yes, and you, of course. So attach, Thank you. attachment styles. Now, I um, train people for a very long time in transaction analysis and now integrative transaction analysis. And both of the uh, models are contact-oriented models. In other words, there's an emphasis on connection and, as important, interruptions to connection. Yeah. Okay, so it's important to understand attachments because connection and attachment are in the same ballpark. And there's been so much written on it. I mean, the sort of major theorists uh, over the years have written many, many different ideas on attachments. Probably the just as Freud was the father of psychoanalysis, I think Bowlby yeah, probably the father of a, uh, you know, who talked many years ago about different attachment styles. Also Winnicott who was a child psychoanalyst talked a lot about um, attachment styles and what that actually means in terms of connection disturbance um, and how they fun- how people different attachment styles function in life and the problems that may or may not bring yeah um, so connections attachment styles are really important I think for therapists to think about and the templates of also templates for working clinically terms of treatment planning etc is really important so it would be odd you know jackie in any training of psychotherapists if you didn't have at least a weekend on attachment styles yeah yeah be really odd so i could talk about many different things but if we talk about very briefly bobby's different uh attachment styles we've got avoidant attachment we've got um Anxious attachment, we've got ambivalent attachment, we've got disorganized attachment. So we've got different attachment styles, and there's many things, many books being written about the different attachment styles. But I'll kick off and say one of the things I think about, you know, uh, despite what attachment styles they come from, is how the person attaches to me or doesn't attach to me in the therapeutic process and what that means yeah is a really good starting point for me yeah what about you yeah absolutely and again you know from from my own personal background being a foster carer as well you know the attachment and how that impacts a relationship going forward is is really important yeah my own as well as theirs because there's always two people 
you know, involved in that connection. There's an energy going from one to the other. It's not like it's just about our attachment style or theirs. We we connect with each other theoretically. Mm. So yeah, really important. So in your fostering experience, um, how can I explain this? Uh, were you taught attachment processes, or did you learn them yourself, or? Well, I I trained as a nursery nurse. That was one of my first jobs. So Bowlby yeah. was was quite, you know, we did a lot about attachment styles and everything. But you know, obviously in a nursery setting and a school setting, you know, that first day at school and how different children react differently to to that first day at school and being left, whether it's in a nursery or whatever, and how that can, you know, impact on a child. How it's how it's dealt with, you know, it's not a trauma, but dependence on how we deal with it, it, it is traumatic. I would think any, especially in your, I know nursing nurse, but I was just thinking fostering again. I would think that all the kids that you dealt with would have had severe ruptures in attachment. Yeah, yeah. From significant others. Yeah, and how that manifests is... is surprisingly unique to each individual child as well gosh how did you find that through doing it for 12 years do you know what I mean it's like you, you, I never took it for granted how a child was going to react or respond to me because they were all unique you know from regression having a, a strapping 15 year old teenage boy completely regressing in their behavior you know and not being what you expect you as a a female feeling feeling quite daunted by this you know six foot strapping lad walking in to being met with somebody who was displaying a much younger age in front of me and what caused that do you think um, but obviously they're, they're in child ego stage, you know what I mean? That that complete shift and reverting back to how it, it was for them in a past a past life. Yeah, I've got that bit, but we're not, I probably haven't indicated what I meant. What was the trigger for that process? You know, what, what triggered the regression, do you think? The fear of the unknown. They didn't know what they were walking into. Right, that's what I was getting to. Yeah, but... yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly yeah. They didn't know what they were going to walk into. The yeah. Zone and how could they attach to you? A protection, yeah. You know, it, it's self survival and and all those sort of things. But yeah, it it, it is unique. You you'd get the ones that it, it was all bravado. Do you know what I mean? That you were nothing to them, and you know that that bravado would be there for a while to them not even acknowledging you were even there. Mm. They'd walk into your house and not even have eye contact with you. Because? Again, it's a, you know, it's a self-preservation, but if they've got an ambivalence attachment style or you're not going to be here, you're not going to stick around, so I don't need to make contact with you. You're not that important to me. Yeah, you see, I think what the way you're talking is really important. Because you're talking from a developmental perspective. Yeah. And when we think of attachment styles, we need to think developmentally. Yeah. Because, how can I explain this? The attachment style is essentially a coping, a coping mechanism mm. to survive, whether it be ambivalent, whether it be anxious. Yeah. Be, whichever way we look at this, People choose these attachment styles, if you want to say the word choose, as a way of coping in life. Yeah. And the other thing that really used to strike me again, particularly with the fostering, but probably in the therapy room as well, is that, you know, their behaviour was a way of communicating something to me. Absolutely. Without the spoken word, whatever they were displaying in their behaviour was a form of communication and it was up to me to try and decode that a lot of the time. I think that's really, really important, what you've just said. Uh, and often uh, non-verbal non -verbal behaviours uh, were a clue to what was yeah. happening. And yeah. if you understand attachment styles, so for example, 
if somebody regresses in front of you and withdraws and doesn't speak or uh, regresses to a place where they um, don't have contact with you, then if you understand attachment styles in a developmental perspective, it gives you a clue to what's going on mm. and how to be yeah. in the therapy room. Yeah. Because we all have attachment styles. It, it's part of being a human being. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we can have a very... This, this is one thing that always used to come up for me in training. was We can have a really healthy, appropriate, happy childhood. <laughs> but we will always have something from that that we take into our presence mm. you know it's not all doom and gloom but you know having a, a, a healthy happy life means that we would probably have a very resilient attachment style mm. oh i'll put it in bobby's term a secure attachment yeah style. yeah so it, it's not it's not just about the bad stuff even you know if if you nothing ever goes wrong which is highly unlikely in your past you will have behaviors because of your past experiences whatever they are whether it like you said it's really secure and it's trusting and everything but that's based on your experience of growing up that's right and if we think developmentally there's a concept from ta which i really like which is the four existential life positions yeah which you can put together with attachment styles so for burn the four existential life positions that we learn in childhood as a way of coping if you like you'd have i'm okay you're not okay yeah you know i'm not okay you are okay uh, the most resilient of them all of course i'm okay you are okay that secure attachment yeah and then the uh which often leads to disorganized attachment is I'm not okay, you're not okay. Yeah. Now, if you put them across with the attachment styles, if you know, if you think about it this way, somebody who's got an I'm okay, you're not okay position, uh, existential position, they're more likely to not trust people, um, to have a disorganized way of thinking perhaps because they don't trust themselves they don't trust other people they think everybody's out to get them they're more likely to perhaps uh move to a position of homicide or even move to a position of attacking yeah uh, because they see the world in such a scary place somebody from i'm okay you're not okay is much more likely to go to, to, to a paranoid position and the attachment is going to be uh pretty avoidant really so you can start putting these existential life positions with the attachment yeah processes and you get a quite a um a comprehensive diagnostic system yeah about how how you can treat or work with people i i did find the life positions or the okay corral or whatever you want to yeah, call it really life. helpful I refer back to that again and again and again. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yes, because these life positions will also reflect their attachment styles. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in the therapy room, uh, you sounds like you think of the uh, existential positions in terms of diagnosis quite a lot yeah yeah i'm bringing it into the the client's awareness as well that we do you know we do have these different places you know on how we feel about ourselves and the other person but yeah i i, I am quite educational in in my mm. sessions and i i i like it i like structure myself so to be able to talk with that you know, tool with a client I find really useful. That's right. So if somebody's got an avoidant attachment, for example, they're going to be quite withdrawn. Yeah. And they're not only going to be quite withdrawn in terms of the physical energy, but also in their energetic response to you. Mm. So they'll be quite passive. Yeah. 
and next bit is how you contact or attempt to contact somebody from an avoidant place because usually their motivation to connect with you will be low now the next question i always used to think to myself well not a question a statement really was that well they had enough motivation to come to therapy mm. so their desire is to connect yeah that's it's just their history is against them yeah yeah which is really interesting you know how do you connect with somebody because and again when, when i said earlier on about you know it it takes two to make a connection and i i'm quite happy talking about me personally but for me you know i've got a, quite a strong please others and and a people pleaser so if i've got somebody that's quite ambivalent about making that connection it's really easy for me to to constantly try to make that connection with that person yeah and, and, and that's a good way to put it because it may it may be that they have a relational need for initiation which hasn't been met yeah and at the same time uh one of the dangers might be that they would be overwhelmed that by... that's exactly my you know my point that to, to dip in and dip out is okay for some people but, you know for me out of my awareness it's i've done something wrong if they disconnect mm. so it, it's it's really interesting the dynamics that can take place around attachment styles mm. i think what you're talking about is very uh prevalent for therapists especially the beginning therapists mm. who want to rush in and help and uh you know utilize their tree try hard driver to a large extent and and put a lot of energy into yeah. connecting and as as i'm saying often the uh, client can feel overwhelmed and yeah withdraw even more yeah totally which okay. again it does come with experience you know and, and i know we've spoke about it in other podcasts you know silence can be quite profound in the therapy room and having space to just hold the client if that makes sense rather than trying to fix the client all the time yeah another podcast we should have should it be about the dangers of um attempting to invert a code fix clients yeah yeah because definitely the only person who can fix the client is themselves yeah but, uh, the beginning therapist will certainly often come from that position yeah I did in the beginning. That was why I went into, you know, fostering and nursery nursing and being a therapist. It was, you know, my my past. It was my job to fix people. I soon learned that that's not the way to do it. <laughs> well, the problem is the only person in the end who can fix themselves, unfortunately, is the client. Absolutely. You can help them on the way. Yeah. You can help them become more aware of their coping mechanisms, yeah. uh, their script decisions and how it you know plays out today um and in the end they're the only people who can really take ownership and responsibility for change however um beginning therapists particularly and often th very experienced ones uh, fall into this trap of uh, perhaps trying too hard or over helping oh. and the client then feels overwhelmed and overstimulated and uh, moves away yeah and I think with experience or or you know just just learning to be okay with ourselves as therapists you just start to back off a little bit <laughs> with clients and and, and the, the impact of that is quite positive mm. I think, and having an awareness that, you know, my state of mind fluctuates as much as what the client does. And sometimes I will be in my script, but being aware of when I'm in my script is is really a valid thing to do and, and to be able to be authentic in the therapy room. Well, that's why the UKCP, which is the United Kingdom Cancer Psychotherapy Regulating Body, um, requires all people who are trained to be therapists to have at least 40 hours of their own therapy mm. per year yeah 
it's 160 over four years of training. Yeah. And the reason for that is, is exactly what you're talking about here, is that they have enough awareness perhaps to be aware in the moment. They're acting out from their own script. Yeah. And change it, or at least get to a place where they can move to an adult position. Yeah. Whereas clients, of course, you know, are usually unaware they're acting out the uh, uh, script. Yeah. So I think the therapist, in, from my position, I think they have a duty to actually uh, understand their own script and under, understand their own therapeutic process so they don't merge with their clients. Yeah. Yeah. And understanding that we have attachment styles as well. You know, we're, we're not immune to all of the things that we're working through with our clients. We also need to work through on ourselves, exactly like what you were saying. Yeah. Now, if we can stay an adult, we won't act out so much. But 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 the, the clue to all this is your own therapy. Yeah. And I always get appalled. And pardon me for all these counsellors that might be listening. But I always get appalled when I am reminded that the BACP, which is the regulating body really for counsellors, um, don't ask for any uh, counselling and their uh, counsellors to have therapy themselves or counsel themselves. Um, I know most counselling programmes may demand that if you're trained to be a counsellor, they should have some counselling. Um, it's not a requirement by the regulating body, but even so, quite often uh, people in counselling training are only required by their training bodies, whatever body it is, to have 20 hours, yeah. four years. And I, I think it doesn't help them, not in the long run. Yeah, I often joke that I didn't realise there was anything wrong with me until I started doing my therapy training. <laughs> I thought I was fine until I started training. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a very common reaction. And then four years later, you uh, realise that you, you've dealt with a lot of challenges. And yeah. with clients, then you're more able to be aware of when you're in the script quicker. Yes, yeah. I'm not saying that you won't move into script, script and still be unaware of it, but you have a, at least you have more chance to get out of script quicker and have some reflection and therapeutic process so you don't merge with your clients. Yeah. And again, supervision is always really important with all of this. Yeah. You know, not just yeah. personal therapy, but having supervision that you can take things to as well. Yeah. You are right about, though, what you're talking about, which uh, is the reflection that therapists come often for their own attachment styles. Mm. The point I'm making there, though, is if you have therapy, you know, consistent therapy, you can become aware quicker of your attachment styles. Yeah. And maybe hopefully move to a more secure one. Yeah. Where you don't act out in the therapy room. Yeah. Because I think for me, you know, and again, I might be looking through rose coloured glasses or whatever, but I. I'm very aware of my attachment to the client. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not like it's just a job and I go in there without me personally being in the room, if that makes sense. It's not clinical for me. It's important that I do connect with the client and that there is a, a relationship that builds up over time with that client. And I'm invested in that. Well, I like to call it a clinical relationship. Yes, yeah. I mean, I think that's important. It's not that, you know, I think it's important because you work with the clients will have a clinical focus. And part of the clinical focus, I, because I've known you a long time, is relationship is important. Definitely, and, uh, yeah. And the, the relationships, the relationship aids cure in the, for the client in the long run. So yeah. there's a cl clinical thinking about having relationship uh, uh, in terms of the therapy that you do, it isn't like the relationships you have at home or socially or whatever. absolutely a not. No, yeah, focus. I think that's important to mention. Otherwise, um, you, yeah, there can be a uh, no differentiation in relationships. So, I know with you, is a clinical focus here. 
hundred percent. But I also need to be completely authentic and transparent in that relationship as well. And you talk about the therapist client relationship here, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Because for me, I think clients can sniff out if you're not being authentic. No, you're absolutely right. But the question is, I agree, and that's a great, I have the same principle as you, and that will lead to curative functions. And the, the reflective question is, A, how do you know you're being authentic? You know, and your auto authentic is and all that sort of stuff you talk about. And for me, let's use TA terms for a minute. Uh, to be aware when you're in our script or not, Will only come from reflection and therapy of your own. Yeah, yeah. Then you'll know whether you're being authentic or not. Yeah. But I agree with you that the aim is an authentic clinical relationship where you build up a robustness so that the client can trust you in a safe place to be able to do the work they need. Yeah. And, you know, to finish up with Bob, like you always say, you know, therapy is a, you know, it's a process, <laughs> not an event. And that goes for us as well. You know, it's it's not as soon as we qualify that we've got all the answers and everything's fine because life will throw us a curveball and it is a process. Mm -hmm. I, I, you're right. And hopefully we can offer our clients a uh, space for secure attachment. Yeah. Because it's from that place that awareness and cure is most likely to happen. Yeah. And um, of course, again, I'll say that a person's attachment style is their coping mechanism. So to get to a place of secure attachment um, is a process, not an event. Yeah. As you've just said. Yeah. But I do think. For a therapist to think developmentally and think about connections and attachment styles and the interruptions to contact um, is a wonderful template for the way forward clinically, positively. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. So thank you, Bob. You're welcome. If this is our last one of the year, it what is. a way to end. I know, yeah. I, I think it's a really good place to end. And maybe what we should do next time is, you know, what do we do if a client leaves unexpectedly? That's another one for a podcast. Yeah. Um, another one, of course, is um, a wonderful book that Eric Byrne wrote. It was called What You Say After You Say Hello mm. in uh, 1969, all about script theory. I've got that. Yeah. yeah. And it's like what you know what you know, what what do we say um from the moment of beginnings with our clients mm. is it a, you know what do we say after say hello is it is it make a good pack podcast wouldn't it it would it would so will it, it'll be a surprise when we come back in the new year <laughs> what the first one is going to be who knows yeah 2000 oh my god 2023 yes God, I'll be 73. Well, yeah. it's, it, I don't even know where the last three years have gone, Bob, to be honest. Well, I, I hope it's a wonderful new year for you and uh, you too. Yeah. And here's to that, your health, and also many, many connections through podcasts. And you said uh, earlier, I wish you, you know, all the viewer, viewers in our yeah, YouTube channel and listeners, um, a very good new year. Yeah. If that's the right word. Yeah. I think that's a lovely way to end. Yeah. And a happy new year. Absolutely. Okie doke, Bob. Until next time. Thank you so much. Yeah. See you in 2023. I'll see you next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. That way. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.